governments will sometimes turn around and say, well, you know, there's no point in looking at infrastructure because China's already there and China's doing it. What do you say to companies that come to you perhaps and say that and say, listen, there's no point? When you talk about technology in its current form, I believe that the West, the traditional West, certainly has the upper hand in technology. We cannot say that because of China, you are excluding the traditional West. There should be a conscious effort to combine investment from all directions and from all angles, because you need to develop and develop very fast. So we, we should not say because of China, we wouldn't invest. There are some technologies which are not in China, which are in Germany, which are in Japan. And therefore, I think investment is not only money. Investment is also know-how. Investment is also expectation. So we would want to look at China, and we're going to look at the West, particularly UK, Germany, and France. These are our traditional allies. Therefore, please, when we are looking for investment, our first location will be UK, Germany, and France. The Chinese will be the latecomers, but we wouldn't ignore them because they are now looking at investment from other, call it non-traditional combinations. It's something I appealing to you to do the same because we have the resources, we don't have the capital, we don't have the know-how, but we need to create jobs for our people and time is not on our side. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I have a very simple view towards this question, this issue. For many, many years, African governments were lectured by how much we sh should introduce competition into our economies and our, because the people will benefit. Uh, so why not have more competition for people investing in our countries? So I think I welcome the interest from China. Uh, I think we have to, of course, read the small print. We also have to negotiate very hard and make sure that the benefits are sufficient for the African countries and the African economies. But I think there's nothing wrong with, with talking to very different sources of finance and investment and seeing what's in our best interest. One thing I've noticed, though, um, over the years, and I've been involved in quite a few negotiations and discussions with the Chinese, is that they are very comfortable with sovereign risk, government to government type transactions. They are less comfortable with commercial risks, um, whereas you find that many investors from different parts of the world are a lot more comfortable with commercial risk. Um, so there's a complementarity, I think, uh, in the way that we look at these things. But I think it's, it's, for, it's, for, it's for us as Africans to make sure that we negotiate the best transactions for ourselves and our people. Um, and I think it's good to be open to all sources of finance. I'd actually, I'd actually like to add something. I was also just in China recently, and I've been approached by the Chinese government to invest in your best startups. And the issue that I have is that you have Silicon Valley, and you have American investors, and you have the Chinese government all vying for the same startups. You as the Ghanaian government ultimately, I think, should be advising us in terms of who would you like as investors in your most exciting startups. So. That's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> Good point. Question over here. Two or three, in fact. Good morning. My name is VJ of a company called Paragon Agri. I was very pleased to hear uh, about the emphasis you are making on uh, agriculture. But it is not included in your footprint for infrastructure, because agriculture depends very much on substantial investment in particularly uh, irrigation uh, infrastructure. Is it part of your brief? Thank you. Now, as a, an investor, potential investor, I want to say, I'm not just interested in the profitability of my business and or the stability of the city, but also a conducive political environment. And from a lot that's been said here, it is quite critical that we have a government that is committed to it and is able to really achieve uh, the things that would ensure that my business uh, profits and profits for a considerable uh, length of time. I'm just concerned that your party, when in government, 
the, seems to forget the necessity for keeping power because with all the lovely achievements you seem to lose election and we're wondering whether it's a case of uh, not managing expectations of the machinery that runs the election properly and or not being sufficiently populist because it's politics you are in for example currently people are clamoring for prosecution of the corrupt uh, politicians who have been in the past and the government is waiting for a special prosecutor uh, to to undertake the task when indeed you have sufficient institutions which can deal with them uh, so minister my question is uh, are you prepared to undertake the necessary steps to ensure the sustainability of your, indeed beyond eight years? I don't want to invest in the country. Very well. You made any investment so far? Uh, and what are, what are the, some of the sectors you're looking at? Uh, what's your pipeline looking like at the moment? Agriculture without irrigation creates unreliability, the final product. And as part of our manifesto, we came out with something called One Village, One Dam. And we are living to it. We are now revising, looking at all the old irrigation projects, and we are providing dams at the villages to support agriculture, particularly in the northern part of the country. So indeed, it is right on the agenda and a very key component of our agriculture development. Now, I think I mentioned clearly that our manifesto had two areas of concentration, creating employment and fighting corruption in my presentation. Now, fighting corruption, yes, we also promised in that same manifesto that we shall establish the office of the special prosecutor, independent of the government. You see, we have the attorney general under our constitution we have the sole authority and power to do prosecution in the country. The Attorney General is part of the executive. And therefore, people sometimes equate the Attorney General's prosecution to witch hunting. And you want a situation where people also trust the system of pre prosecution. So we promise to appoint a special prosecutor. Because of the law we have, we've got to go to parliament and change the law such that a special prosecutor can be appointed to do this independently. We have done the draft gone through cabinet. Cabinet has approved amendment to the law to, for the appointment of the special prosecutor to give reliability of the public and faith in the prosecution. But it has to be approved by parliament. We have submitted it to the Speaker's office and Parliament at this sitting. So by end of August, September, will establish the office of the Special Prosecutor. And it isn't the President who will appoint. The President will nominate for Parliament to do the appointment. The idea is for people to believe in the work of the Special Prosecutor. So we are surely going to go along those lines and please Ghanaians about our faith in fighting corruption. It is true that people believe that we come in, we are able to govern very well, keep very good microeconomic stability, etc., etc. But we do not appear to work to, to, towards staying in power. We obviously have learned our lessons. And therefore, I believe as part of the arrangements, we are not only talking about good governance, we are not talking about establishing very stable macroeconomic environment. We are not talking about only doing good things for the country. We are also thinking about ensuring that we are able to complete our programs. And that means staying in. But you cannot do that without pleasing the people who have the voting power. So what you should really do is think, how do you continuously uh, court the confidence of your voting population so that you can stay in power on the mandate of the people? And we are thinking seriously along those lines. There have been problems of rigging elections in Ghana. You know it, because we went to court in 2012 to say that we have been cheated. And I believe it, and every Ghanaian thinks so, that that court we went was very useful. Because at the end of the day, the Supreme Court came out 
and defined that elections are won at the polling station. So you must make sure you are vigilant at the polling station. We did that, taking the cue from the Supreme Court, and the results of the elections were clear. We won and won massively. So we are putting structures in place in the Electoral Commission to ensure that rigging is out of the dictionary of the country Ghana. Elections must be fairly conducted so that when you win election, you win on the grounds of having the mandate of the people. So young man, the steps have been put in place, but in all fairness, we are working hard at it. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Solomon. Irrigation. Thank you. Yes, I'd rather talk about irrigation. Um, no, I, maybe I misspoke. I thought I said agribusiness. Pure agriculture is less of a focus area for us. One of the things we're trying to do as the fund is we're going to have, we're going to, have to achieve a return, uh, a satisfactory return on our, on our fund. So we, we're going to invest in areas where there is cash flow and generation. So we're more on the, on the agribusiness, adding value. We, we export too many raw fruits and commodities, as you know, so we're going to look and see if we can add value within Ghana. So on the agri-processing -proce side, it's definitely a part uh, of our mandate. Um, on the investment so far, um, I've only been here six weeks, so I'm still relatively new. But we have actually approved our first investment, which will be in part of the, the rehabilitation uh, of the airport, Kotoka Airport. This time next year, when you come to Accra, you will see a completely different airport, and you will all be so impressed. Um, so that's our first investment, and our investment helps to unlock some long-term financing from other institutions, which is going to be the role of, of, of GIF. We can't, we, $250 million in one hand is a lot of money. In another hand, compared to the needs, is a very small amount of money. So we're looking to complement whatever money we put investments uh, and draw some additional money from the private sector. But we, our investment areas, as I mentioned, power, um, transportation infrastructure, uh, agribusiness, um, heavy industries, cement, fertilizers, which, again, the senior minister mentioned is an important area for Ghana going forward, telecommunications infrastructure. These are the sorts of areas that we'll be focusing on. Thank you. We've been in Ghana for five years now, the first two years independently, but we've since been working with a local partner and that has made the biggest difference. We're now looking to move into ECOWAS companies, um, countries. You mentioned Ghana's relationship with ECOWAS countries. That's of interest to me. Can you please give me an example of some countries you work with within ECOWAS? I know, for example, the president was recently in Sierra Leone, where I am from. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on your strongest partnerships within ECOWAS? Um, so I understand that under the fund, there is also one more instrument that you are considering, which is the risk mitigation uh, guarantees. So could you please give a little bit more of detail on how that will be uh, applied for the renewable energy sector, especially on the PPA's power purchase agreement bankability? Thank you. Thank you very much. The question on ECOWAS is very relevant. ECOWAS is economic community of West African states. But so far, that community has concentrated on political and military issues, sending peace, keeping people from Ghana to help stabilize other countries, etc., etc. ECOWAS obviously is a uh, customs union. Well, that is what our detailed uh, statutes call for. You may perhaps realize that when our president came to power, his first assignment was to visit all our neighboring countries, all the ECOWAS countries. And we went with a simple brief of ensuring that the customs union aspects of ECOWAS treaty works. We now encouraging finance ministers of ECOWAS to have routine quarterly meetings every three months to remove all the bottlenecks which impede doing business within the ECOWAS. The most significant members of ECOWAS in terms of size is of course Nigeria. And we are establishing special relationship with Nigeria to make sure that things work smoothly within ECOWAS. Our president is very committed 
to good neighborliness. In other words, committed to ECOWAS. And therefore, I think we are resolving that problem. And at the moment, we've agreed that even road barriers, when you are traveling from Accra to Nigeria, you have to pass through Togo, you have to pass through Berlin, and you are harassed on the way by police with all kinds of excuses, looking at your passport license and in the process, corruption plays a very key role. We've agreed to remove all barriers. You have as many as between Accra and Nigeria, 78 barriers, 78 checkpoints. And within Ghana alone, we have about 11. We've removed all in Ghana except one at the entry point. So we are trying to facilitate business within ECOWAS. And Ghana Investments Promotion Council is mandated to work hard at this to ensure smooth business within ECOWAS. So, Madam, we, we, we are aware of this, and all members of the ECOWAS know that our development, our prosperity depends on a smooth functioning of ECOWAS, and therefore we are working to ensure that we achieve that objective. Um, just very quickly on the risk mitigation, we have a, a wide range of instruments that we can use, equity, debt, and anything in between, and uh, also guarantees and risk mitigation instruments. Just simply put, I mean, we can partially guarantee to unlock local currency financing or local participation. Uh, in the renewables area, again, the Minister, the Deputy Minister of Energy will speak to that, I'm sure, this afternoon. But it's going to be an increasing priority for the country um, to really tap um, the, particularly the sun resources that we have. So we can either invest alongside or we can unlock some local funding through guarantee structures. I'm uh, going back to ECOWAS in Nigeria, I'm afraid. And the question is, um, Nigeria doesn't want to sign this uh, partnership with the EU. I'm just wondering what uh, the Ghana position is and whether there will be an ECOWAS-wide, I think it's called EPA. And uh, since I got the microphone, I think we'll have one, if I can ask a very quick question. I suppose, going back to China and, and uh, Solomon. So, so China likes sovereign risk, you're saying, but not uh, private risk, whatever. So my question is, um, private risk, but in other countries, of course, um, they ask for government guarantee. So uh, would, that, would that be the position in Ghana? So loan to Ghana, a Chinese loan, sorry, to a non-government institution in Ghana backed by Ghana government loan guarantee. Let me clarify what I said. What I said is my experience, the Chinese have been more comfortable with government-to-government -government transactions. Uh, and many of the private sector also prefer commercial transactions if they're structured correctly. Um, obviously, they will always ask for a government guarantee if they can get it. But um, the Ministry of Finance has been very clear that government guarantees are going to be less and less available um, for Ghana because we just simply can't afford it. So we will be look for structured transactions where we can mitigate the risks where possible and look for private sector financing. So I hope that's, hope that's clear. Uh, we've had an excellent speech from Adam Free. I think if I may give the floor from the floor to, um, to Tim, maybe to say a few words from HMG's point of view. Ghana is uh, uh, very much uh, a market of enormous interest to all of us, all of us in the room, but also to the, to the British government. Uh, I've been appointed, I've <clears throat> been a, an ambassador in three African countries, and I've been appointed uh, by the DIT, the Department of International Trade, to work with other government departments here to try to help us uh, raise our ambition level within government, listening to business, but also working with African governments, working with African business, uh, to try to raise our game generally. And that applies to government itself. Uh, we need to, to work out our own systems so that they are comprehensible to business, so that people know where to, to go. And I'll be very much looking forward to, to, to people's, um, to businesses' views as, uh, as I go along, working with the envoy. Uh, but Ghana, as is shown by today's uh, event, is in the Premier League, to use your sporting <laughs> analogy. Uh, this is really an example of uh, how to put together a presentation based on real propositions 
Uh, it's a very exciting time we all live in. Um, development requires jobs, requires private sector engagement. Those in the room here today are those who can help you. Uh, we as government should devise the mechanisms of consultation and action and increased activity, as I think you can see in UKEF and the packages now being put together which are helping countries like Ghana. Uh, so we're very optimistic within government about this uh, and I will be looking forward to as many contacts as I can with business. Thank you very much. Uh, and we've had some very, very good presentations right through for the, the whole of the morning. I think, again, it's reinforced this buzz that is in the air. And for the panel here, who probably should be in asleep rather than, uh, <laughs> than having to uh, face everybody, could I ask you to show your appreciation? Thank you. Thank you.